welcome one and all to the Getty Center. I'm Mary Miller, director of the Getty Research Institute, and it is indeed a pleasure to welcome you all here today. I start today by invoking the powerful passing of time. Two of the greats, Los Grandes, have died in the past few days. First, last week, Michael Coe, my own last living teacher of Mesoamerica, who had marked his 90th birthday, uh, died. And then I learned that one of his last requests was that he convey his regrets at not being able to attend this conference in honor of his great compadre, Don Miguel Leon Portilla. Don Miguel died, last, died just Tuesday in Mexico City. Of course, as you all see in the program and as you have known all along, this conference is dedicated to Don Miguel. Keep him in your heart, in your mind. Every paper over the next three days is dedicated to this giant of 16th century scholarship, a master of the Aztecs, the Mexica, the Nahuatl-speaking peoples. He is here with us, his spirit, his energy, and his voracious appetite for new knowledge. We gather atop a mountain that was known to many indigenous peoples for a few thousand years, visible from the great sea to the west, hardly Pacific to any of you who've tried to navigate it. We, my colleagues at Cal State LA, a new collaboration for the Getty Research Institute and in the Getty Research Institute, wish to focus attention on the title, The Arrival of Strangers. No one in the Americas invited these strangers. Even though the new world, as the strangers turned it, was no, was no stranger to war and violence. But no one could have imagined the destruction of the new world's people, ecosystems, belief systems, in this year of art and ecology, our Getty Research Institute theme for the year, it is worth noting that the indigenous population of Mexico witnessed in just the first 30 years of Spanish occupation how European grazing animals turned a veritable Eden into Extremadura, the province from which many of the Spanish invaders had come, an ecological nightmare of erosion and silting. At the same time, the canals that had made the Spanish initially liken the city to Venice alarmed the invaders, and so they quite literally paved paradise. Just to set the stage for the next few days, in what we now think of as the Republic of Mexico, indigenous populations dropped somewhere between 90 to 95 percent over the 16th century. Just pause on that number. That anything survives is a miracle. No wonder that celebrations of this year, of 1519, in its 500th anniversary, are few and far between. So we dig deeper to understand outcomes and engagement, to pull back the curtain on the 16th century. The adage is often repeated that history is the record of the victors. But as in many such commonplaces, this is European received wisdom. For much of pre-Hispanic Mexico, the defeated often embedded meaning in surprising ways from the formal in which an art style might seemingly be captured to iconography, which may provide a quiet access to the knowledge of the past. I am grateful to Manuel Aguilar Moreno, professor of art history at Cal State LA, who came to me a little less than a year ago <laughs> to, with the challenge to bring this topic to life in Southern California, my new home. You will also meet the dedicated and devoted students from Cal State who will be omnipresent both here at Getty and at Cal State. To continue this welcome, I now turn to my Getty colleague, Kim Richter. Good morning. Welcome, bienvenidos, Shimo Panolti, to our symposium 1519, The Arrival of Strangers, Indigenous Art and Voices, Following the Spanish Conquest of Mesoamerica, 
with which we wish to acknowledge the quincentennial of the arrival of the Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés and his men to the shores of Mesoamerica and the ensuing war and conquest. This symposium grows out of a major initiative here at the Getty Research Institute dedicated to the study and dissemination of the Florentine Codex, the 16th century encyclopedic manuscript written and painted in Mexico City in Nahuatl and Spanish by Franciscan friar Bernardino de Sahagún and a team of Nahuatl authors and art artists. Over the course of the symposium, you will learn a lot about this manuscript held at the Biblioteca Medicea Laurentiana, where it has formed part of the Medici collection since the 1580s. The first two days of the symposium will reflect the collaborative research that our team has been conducting over the past three years. The event is also the result, as you've already heard, of our collaboration with Manuel Aguilar from Cal State LA and his students from the Art History Society who've enriched our community by organizing yearly symposia dedicated to pre-Columbian and Latin American art. This collaboration allowed us to extend the topic for the symposium and invite speakers who go beyond the Florentine Codex and address the broader consequences of the Spanish conquest, which did not end in 1521 with the fall of the Mexica cities Tenochtitlan and Tlatelolco, but slowly and painfully continued on for several century, centuries and one could argue is still ongoing with far-reaching consequences, including for Los Angeles and the very hill on which we stand today. To indicate the temporal and geographic extent of this process of invasion, war, and conquest on part of the Spanish Empire, we invited contributions that span from the Maya region across Mexico to Southern California, where the local Tongva people and other indigenous groups put up a fierce resistance against the invading Spaniards. I also wish to acknowledge my co-directors of the Florentine Codex initiative, whose generosity of mind and spirit have enriched the whole endeavor. Diana Magaloni, Jeanette Peterson, and Kevin Terraciano. Our initi initiative and the event would not have been possible without the partnership with the Siever Institute, headed by Victoria Siever Dean, who believed in the project from the beginning and supported the research phase. We are also grateful for the generous support of the J. Paul Getty Trust. I thank my Cal State LA colleagues, Manuel and his students for this fruitful collaboration, as well as my colleagues here at the Getty Trust, at Getty Trust events, particularly Adrian Cáceres, Aaron Harvey, and all the AV techs, you can wave to them up there, um, and at the GRI, above all, Mary Miller for our new director, for her unwavering support and instantaneous support uh, of the initiative right when she arrived. Um, also to John Keefe, who's standing back there and who will be filming the presentations, and especially Jennifer de la Fuente, the tireless logistical mastermind behind this event, without whom we would, there would be no speakers, no food, and we would be sitting in darkness and chaos. And with that, I turn it over to my compa, Manuel Zin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Manuel Aguilar Moreno, uh, and <laughs> otherwise I will be like this. So. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. They saved me a, a neck pain, so that's good. Uh, on behalf of California State University, Los Angeles, uh, uh, I want to greet all of you, speakers and general public that accompany us today. Uh, for this symposium, I don't say the name again because it has been mentioned and it's there, uh, a symposium in homage to Miguel Leon Portilla. It is for us a great honor to have had the privilege to organize this symposium with the Getty Research Institute. And we want to thank the generosity and the great coordination in all the diverse aspects of the event. And we want to thank Mary Miller, Kim Richter, and Jen de la Fuente who, uh, as if we would have met uh, 50 years ago, we, everything flowed very well, and we are very happy of this collaboration. Uh, and also because they believe in, in, in us and integrating us with their 
a symposium about the Florentine Codex. And as you will see, everything matches perfectly, like uh, pieces of a perfect puzzle. Um, I, I want also to con congratulate and thank the Art History Society, an organi a student organization uh, that are fans of Mesoamerica, and, and uh, they, they are the uh, uh, operational team of the symposium in, in many aspects. It, very well coordinated with Jen de la Fuente because that's the, the base of the organization. Uh, I, was, uh, I want to thank also uh, the, some, some of our sponsors that uh, uh, help us tremendously to put together, together with the Getty and the other sponsors. Uh, Cal State LA, Art History Society, Associated Students Inc., the uh, Mexican consulate that we have here, uh, Dr. Fabiola Garcia Rubio, uh, who is the academic and educational consul of the uh, consul general, consulate general of Mexico and, and uh, accompanying us here. I want to thank Delta, Aeromexico, Tortillería La Patria, uh, Planet Green Environmental, Far Horizons, RD Foundation, and UNAM Los Angeles for helping us in sponsoring the event. Our symposium explores the situation of the indigenous populations and their contributions after the conquest. We recognize their resilience and survival in the new world. So we focus our, uh, especially on Saturday and, and integrated with uh, the, the work that our indigenous people did in the Florentine Codex. We want to emphasize the indigenous that were alive, the ones that survived this tremendous uh, genocidal uh, situation, and were the ones who continues as Indios Ladinos and later on in the colonial centuries, keeping the, the core of their culture, uh, the, the survival of the pre-Columbian things. Um, the, 19, the, the, the 2019 symposium is a memorial and a tribute to the eminent uh, and very well admired scholar, Dr. Miguel Leon Portilla. He's recognized internationally as one of the most prominent specialists on the language and cultures of pre-Columbian civilizations, uh, specifically the Aztecs. With the publication of La Visión de los Vencidos, translated in English as Broken Spears, Leon Portilla proposed a new form of historiography whose purpose was to show the story from the point of view of the conquered rather than the traditional vision of the conquerors. Uh, we welcome you all again uh, to what promises to be a spectacular and emotional symposium. Muchas gracias. Thank you all for coming to our first day of our three-day symposium. We're super excited to be here. My name is Raquel Rojas, and I am the former president of Cal State LA's Art History Society. And collaborating with the Getty was, uh, has been a beautiful journey, and I'm glad we're finally done. On behalf of the Art History Society, thank you. Thank you, Kim Richter, Mary Miller, and Jen de la Fuente for recognizing the amazing work that Cal State LA students have to offer. Thank you to all of our sponsors. And next, I would like to thank Profe, um, better known as Dr. Manuel Aguilar Moreno. You are the binder that connected these two worlds together. You are a great maestro. Lastly, I need to recognize the five, ah, the five Latina women who put, oops, Latina women who stayed up late nights through the weekend, infinity and beyond. Erica Garcia, April Ramos, Stephanie Pineda, and Vanessa Bravo. We are all first-generation college students. We are first-generation graduate students. We have full-time jobs, full-time at Cal State LA, and full-time at the Art History Society. We are daughters of service workers, seamstresses, farm workers, and parents who own a tortilleria. 
and mujeres, we made it. Thank you for all your hard work and commitment and for love for what we do. With all that said, I hope you enjoy our program. And um, I will pass it on to Fabiola Garcia Rubio, who represents the Consul for American Academic Co Cooperation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Fabiola Garcia, and I work for the Consulate General of Mexico. It is, a, it, it is a pleasure for me to be here at the symposium in honor of Miguel Leon Portilla, 1519, the arrival of strangers. Thank you so much for the invitation, and particularly to my colleague, Professor Manuel Aguinda Aguilar, for continuing to strengthen ties between Cal State University and the Consulate General of Mexico in Los Angeles. Thank you very much. As a historian, I know how important these academic events are. This is a great opportunity to share knowledge, to meet colleagues, and to create new projects. Therefore, I would like to invite you to take advantage of these three wonderful days in this beautiful city, in this beautiful, incredible place. But also, I would like to, th to invite you to think about this symposium as one of the many ways that exist to strengthen the relationship between the United States and Mexico. This event shows that inside the academic world, we can build bridges, we can create bonds, and we can understand our neighbors. From the Consulate General of Mexico, in addition to our daily work, we want to foster these initiatives because we are convinced that knowledge is the only way to combat against prejudice, discrimination, and racism. Finally, and I won't keep you any longer, I just want to thank all the people and institutions who were involved in the organization of this symposium. The Getty Research Institute, Cal State University of Los Angeles, professors, students, and sponsors. Welcome and thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Hi again. Our first presentation is by Baltasar Brito Guadarrama, who received his PhD in Mesoamerican Studies at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. He specialized in Mexican codices, the history of New Spain, and Mexican literature. Since 2013, Brito Guadarrama has served as director of Mexico's Biblioteca Nacional de Antropología y e Historia. Please join me in welcoming Kim Richter, who will be presenting his paper titled, the Creation, Creating the Florentine Codex. Thank you. Baltasar's arrival has been, as you can all perhaps imagine, uh, delayed due to the passing of Don Miguel Leon Portilla, so I will be reading his presentation. Baltasar will join us tomorrow and speak about Don Miguel's legacy on Saturday. There was no going back. The warm winds of Seville had filled the sails of the Santa Maria, that heavy vessel that, heading on to New Spain, once again moved away from the port city of San Lucar de Barrameda. Thus, in between avasts and drifts, a journey slightly longer than two months awaited the crew of this small floating city. On board, uncomfortable between, between brown color habits, distinguished the 21 friars of the Seraphic Order of St. Francis from the pages, sailors, and cabin boys. One of the former, named Bernardino de Sahagún, like his brothers, had the mission of broadening the Catholic faith throughout the length and breadth of the recently conquered lands in the Americas. Nevertheless, life, destiny, or perhaps God, also had another type of work reserved for him, preserving the cultural memory of a people and, ultimately, that of a whole nation. It was the final days of the month of August, 1529. In general, these transatlantic trips were truly miserable occasions. Some contemporary passengers who made the trip at the time described the ships they traveled in as, quote, a very tight and very hard prison where no one could flee, even if they do not wear irons or chains, 
so, and so cruel that it makes no difference between its prisoners. All are equally trapped and squeezed. Great is the squeezing and stifling and heat, end quote. In these circumstances, the art of conversation always helped make the trip more bearable. It was perhaps during one of these talks that Fray Bernardino may, began to take an interest in the Nahua language and culture. Having Fray Antonio de Ciudad Rodrigo as the interpreter on the ship is almost certain, it is almost certain that he listened to the most fascinating stories from the lips of a group of indigenous people who, after having been sent to Cortez to the peninsula, now returned on the same boat with the friars to their own provinces, provinces in the lands of New Spain under royal order of Emperor Charles V. Among these people were the important lords of the Americas, such as Martin Cortez himself, the son of Moctezuma Xocoyotzin, as well as Juan Tezcatl, Diego Yacametl, Santiago, Santiago Piltoctli, and 17 other natives from the important Altepeme of Tlatelolco, Tacuba, Texcoco, Tlaxcala, and Culhuacan. Arriving in Mexico, a desire was born in Sahagún to learn Nahuatl, and with that useful linguistic tool, he began his tire tireless evangelical mission. Over the years, he and other Franciscans, such as Andrés de Olmos, Antio Antonio de Ciudad Rodrigo, and Alonso de Molina, became true Nahuatl speakers and very skilled translators. As a young friar, Sahagún worked as a missionary in several towns, among them Xochimilco and Tlalmanalco, this was before he was elected as professor of Latin in 1536, following the foundation of the Imperial, Imperial Colegio de Santa Cruz de Tlatelolco. The instruction he provided as a teacher there followed Renaissance guidelines, and it was an exclusive place for indigenous youth of noble descent. Fray Bernardino was very well prepared for that mission since he had been educated in the classrooms of the University of Salamanca. Nevertheless, instruction within that educational space was not only hierarchical, but also horizontal, because although the friars were the teachers, they also learned from their students. And with the students' help, they were able to perfect their Nahuatl and learn new and interesting details about the Nahuatl's ancient culture. It was in this place, beginning in 1545, after he had witnessed the ravages of the plague firsthand, where Sahagún began to passionately inquire on the natives past, their customs, and even their deities. He desired to penetrate the deepest secrets of Nahua culture. Like the phoenix, the Franciscan resurfaced from the ashes to combine the roles of an evangelizer, ethno ethnographer, historian, philologist, linguist, and anthropologist all in one. In short, he was a humanist. The document we know today under the title Historia de las Cosas de la Nueva España, History of the Things of New Spain, was the result of an arduous research process uh, that is reflected in a series of manuscripts that are best identified as the Sahaguntin Corpus. All of the manuscripts were prepared by a team of indigenous people, with Fray Bernardino de Sahagún leading as their conductor. That the Franciscan decided to title the work History indicates the Renaissance roots of Sahagún's intellectual formation. Let us not forget that during the 16th century, a good number of scholars were dusting off Greco-Roman classics, especially those had in, that had encouraged the collection, the systemization, and generation of knowledge. Thus, the works of philosophers, naturalists, and historians, such as Aristotle and Pliny the Elder, served as a model for a good number of scientists and intellectuals of the time. In the Italian city-states, for example, were the prominent scholars of the day who struggled to scrutinize what they called the Book of Nature. Um, I highlight here the name Ulysses Aldrovandi, a famous collector of wonders who, following the collection of a variety of biological, mineral, and other curious specimens, decided to write a natural history that complete that would complete one that Pliny, the one that Pliny had developed during the first century after Christ, entitled Naturalis Historia, a work of encyclopedic scope through which the Roman soldier attempted to compile the whole universe of data in just 37 books. 
Pliny's Naturalis Historia resulted from the reading of more than 100 authors, but also of Pliny's own observations, which he compiled in several volumes, Astronomy, meteorolo Meteorology, Geography, Anthropology, History, Ethnographic Beliefs, Deities, Terrestrial, Aquatic, and Volatile, volatile Zoology, including Insects, Botany, Medicine, Mineralogy, Writing, and Art. An entire cultural kaleidoscope of his surroundings. It is very likely that our mendicant friar, Sahagun, was acquainted with the works of this famous Roman scholar, and that in an effort to complement that universal history with numerous new details, or by dint of pure inspiration, he decided to investigate and record the natural environment and belief systems that were unfolding before him in the new continent, the same which, moreover, were totally unknown to the Western world. Of course, it would have been an impossible mission to encompass the entire American territory and the diversity of cultures in it, and his inquiries were limited only to the central region of New Spain and essentially to the Nahua culture. In this way, his observations, notes, and inquiries give us the keys that several centuries later would, become, would come to facilitate our study of pre-Hispanic Mexico. We do not doubt the, Fran the Franciscan's courage to venture into the countryside that opened up to him along his travels. As if he were another Pliny, he climbed the Popocatépetl and the Iztaccíhuatl. He described rivers and streams, explaining their natural origins, and he analyzed the etymology of their names. He even dove into a spring in Xochimilco in order to replace an idol with a stone cross. But, as I mentioned before, such a titanic work was not the task of a single person. In addition to his field work and devoting many hours at his desk, Sahagun also knew also to surround himself with the right individuals to bring, bring his project to fruition, and thus be able to write such a history of indigenous culture that it would, it would include the Mesoamerican visions of the divine, human, and natural worlds. The Sahaguntin corpus developed out of a long process and indigenous informants and tlaquilos, that is, scholar artists, were involved throughout. The former were indigenous elders who yearned for their glorious past, while the latter were skilled and educated young men who, by the way, had been students of Sahagún himself at the Colegio de Tlatelolco. After having survived the deadly epidemic of 1545, Sahagún asked some of the natives how it was that they faced such terrible illnesses before the advent of Christianity. In response, he heard from the mouths of the, mouths of the elders not only the names of several herbs that they used as remedies, but also of the prayers to summon their gods. The friar was so fascinated by this revelation that he told one of his students to copy onto paper, uh, copy these onto paper with the title of Huehuetlatoli, or Testimonies of Ancient Word. With incentives such as this, Sahagun decided to continue his inquiries, although now in a more systematic way. While it is true that it was religious zeal more than a scientific interest that fueled the work's progress, we should not rule out the author's desire for knowledge, primarily in the fields of linguistics, history, anthropology, and ethnography. Thus, the first step in a heuristic manner was to gather as much information as possible. It was in the town of Tepepulco, in the current state of Hidalgo, between 1558 and 1561, that this objective was achieved. There, a group of 12 principales, indigenous lords, headed by Don Diego de Mendoza Tlatensin, a descendant of Ishli Xochitl II, the last Tlatoani of Texcoco, responded to a minuta previously prepared by the Franciscan and used their paintings to support their accounts. The result of this exercise has come to be known as the primer mo Primeros Memoriales, or Memoriales de Tepepulco, wherein the principales recorded in Nahuatl and at times with accompanying pictographic writing, valuable information about religious, ceremonial, calendrical, divinatory, astronomical, and other diverse aspects of the peoples of the Valley of Mexico. At present, these documents are kept incomplete and bound together with the Codices Matritenses, which are divided between the Biblioteca de, del Real Palacio and the Academia uh, de la Historia in Madrid. The next hermeneutical step was to bring the information obtained in Tepepulco 
to the well-known Colegio de Tlatelolco. There, between 1561 and 1565, in the company of his assistants, Sahagun reviewed the results of previous inquiries, which he compared with the testimonies of the elders of Tlatelolco, enriching his research in the aforementioned topics. This second revised draft was given a name by Francisco del Paso y Troncoso, who published it in 1905 as Memoriales de Tlatelolco, or Memorial, Memoriales en Tres Columnas, featuring a core text in Nahuatl at the center, a Spanish text on the left, and glosses or commentaries on the Nahuatl text prepared by Sahagún himself on the right. There was a third stage in this larger work, which was carried out between 1565 and 1568 in the convent of San Francisco in Mexico City. There, alone and without the help of his assistants, the Franciscan collated, commented, and revised the notes obtained in Tepepulco and Tlatelolco. The final result were 12 books written in the Nahuatl language and perhaps augmented with some annotations in Spanish. Unfortunately, today, these books are lost to us. However, it is clear that they served as the basis for preparing the final manuscript of the Historia. During the following years, the fate of the work became uncertain. Sahagún lost the financial resources that the Provincia de Santo and Evangelio had provided him, and the manuscripts that he had arranged at the convent were collected and confiscated because of the possible heretical content. The years passed, and finally in 1575, a silver lining was seen on the horizon, thanks to the help of Fray Rodrigo de Sequera, general commissioner of the Order of St. Francis. Under his protection, Sahagún reunited once again, reunited once again a team of Tlaquilos and translators to give the definitive form to the uh, bilingual manuscript known as the Florentine Codex, currently preserved in the Biblioteca Laurenziana Medicea. Um, in Florence, Italy. It is twelve, it's 12 books divided into four volumes and accompanied by more than 1,800 illustrations contains the long-awaited Historia de las Cosas de Nueva España, the most important work on the Nahua culture of central Mexico. It bears emphasizing this point again. A work of such magnitude could never have been completed without the indigenous informants, translators, and tlaquilos who helped Sahagún in his historical anthropological work. Of the early informants, with exception of Don Diego Mendoza Tlatensin, we do not know their names. For the second group, all of whom were teachers in Latin, Spanish, Nahuatl, and Nahuatl, we only have the following details. Praised by Cervantes de Salazar because of his intelligence, Antonio Valeriano was, quote, the first among them and the wisest, end quote, who along with his academic work also served as gover governor of Azcapotzalco and of other indigenous districts in Mexico City. In the words of Miguel Leon Portilla, there's sufficient evidence to attribute the author authorship of the Nican Mopoa to Valeriano. Also by his side there were, contributor, were the contributions of Andres Leonardo and Martin Jacobita, who became rector of the Colegio de Santa Cruz. Both of them were from Tlatelolco. Natives from Cuatitlan were Pedro de San Buenaventura and Alonso Beregano. The former is well known because of a letter he wrote in Nahuatl to Padre Sahagún regarding the beginning of the year in the pre-Hispanic calendar. As to the latter, Alonso, in his 1576 will, his 1576 will was discovered at the uh, Colección Antigua at the Biblioteca Nacional de Antropología e Historia just five years ago. Thanks to this document, we know that he belonged to a noble family residing in Santa Maria, Cuauhtepotistlan, and that he accompanied Francisco Hernández, the king's primary physician, during Hernández's botanical expedition in New Spain. Hernández even bequeathed Alonso an amount of money as an inheritance. It is very likely that both figures, Pedro and Alonso, are the authors of the so-called Anales de Cuautitlan. We believe the final group of Tlaquilos who helped revise the texts and produce the paintings of the Florentine Codex included Diego de, de Grado, Bonifacio Maximiliano, both neighbors of Tlatelolco, Mateo Severino, originally from the Oyak neighborhood in Xochimilco, 
Thanks to the stylistic studies carried out by Magaloni, Diana Magaloni, we know that there were 22 painters who helped with the Florentine Codex, of which at least four were teachers. Throughout this study, we have succinctly seen how the European traditions, in coexistence with those of the Nawas, gave rise to one of the most important books ever written in the Americas. Behind the writing and development of the Codex, curiosity, scientific interest, and religious zeal coexisted harmoniously. Moreover, this work revealed to the entire world the ancient indigenous tradition, one that ha had been buried only in appearance. It is indeed true, and we cannot hide this fact, that the Mesoamerican peoples were conquered by the Europeans. Nevertheless, many of those foreigners were also conquered by the cultural and natural wealth that they encountered. Fray Bernardino was one of them. The project which he started, coordinated, and happily concluded brought new light to our universal knowledge. Having this in mind, I think that Sahagún, in addition to being a great humanist, is to Mexico what Pliny the Elder is to Rome, and what Aristotle is to ancient Greece, a worthy representative of his culture and one of his, its greatest sages. Thank you. Our next speaker is my profe, Manuel Aguilar Moreno, who is a professor of art history at California State University, Los Angeles. He is a renowned expert on pre-Columbian civilizations, the colonial history of Mexico, and Mexican muralism. Dr. Aguilar Moreno has published on a wide range of subjects, including Mesoamerican art and history, colonial art and history of Mexico, with emphasis on the Indian Christian art of the, of the transculturalization process, funerary art, and the pre-Columbian ballgame. Dr. Aguilar will be presenting the afterlife of the Florentine Codex and Book 12. The Franciscan friar, Fray Bernardino de Sagún, designed and compiled the Historia Universal o General de las Cosas de la Nueva España. That was an encyclopedia in 12 volumes about the people and culture of Central Mexico, specifically the Nahuas or Aztecas. We don't know too much about Sagún's life in Spain, because what we know of him is more about the work he did in Mexico. But uh, this is the remains of the Franciscan convent in Sagún, the, the, the city where Sagún uh, lived his early uh, uh, years. And it probably he was linked in some way to, to the friars here, and perhaps his admiration about the Franciscan order come from that. We know that he studied in the University of Salamanca, but also there are a few lines, two or three lines that we know about that. So when I had the opportunity last year to be in uh, Salamanca for the uh, International Conference of Americanists with the group of uh, the Sagún project of the Getty that I was invited by Kim Richter and Kevin Terraciano and Diana Magaloni, uh, I, I took the challenge to try to follow the footsteps of Sagún. So then, uh, in my visits to the University of Salamanca, so I tried to, d d you find that uh, plaque that was put by the Instituto Indigenista Interamericano, whose director was Miguel Leon Portilla in that time, 1966, when they put this uh, plaque together with other two institutions in Spain, uh, recognizing Sagún uh, studies in Salamanca and his work. This is uh, Aula Fray Luis de Leon, one of the oldest uh, classrooms where probably Sagún, uh, living in the 1550s, uh, 1518 or so, that when he studied in Salamanca, he could have passed through a room like this. But the most important thing is uh, uh, the, the rediscovery of the Franciscan monastery in Salamanca that was almost 100% destroyed during the French invasion in the 19th century, and uh, it, it has been forgotten. I, I look for the Franciscan convent, and I discovered that there is a huge uh, garden, a hu huge plaza called El, El Campo de San Francisco. 
And then investigating, I enter into a Capuchin convent that is nearby, because the Campo de San Francisco used to be the orchard of the Franciscan convent. And I discover the ruins inside. You can never see them from outside. But inside of the Capuchin convent, I discovered the ruins of the Franciscan convent where Sagun entered to the Franciscan order. Uh, and uh, you, I just show you for curiosity. You can see this is the, this is the, um, the new building that is covering the other one. Uh, and these are part of, of this impressive uh, side nave of the, of the church. The only thing that survives is a part of the church, as you can see here because it was burned and things like that. This is a house of the Plateresque style that very probably stayed there when Sagun was living in the city, because it's, in, it's from uh, the 15th century. As we know, um, and it was mentioned in the paper of Baltasar Brito, well, the, the Sagun uh, left different uh, drafts, different, different parts of the process of writing the Florentine Codex. We have the Primeros Memoriales, the, Manuscrito de Tepepulco, again here. The memorials in, in three columns that were mentioned also. You can see that this was the original idea of Sagun to write the Florentine Codex like, like that, including Escolios, no, notes. Uh, this is the original of the Florentine Codex uh, the, 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 that was the, the, the final version, we think, in 1577 that was sent to Spain and is now in the Biblioteca Lorenziana. This, uh, this is uh, to show you how we have, mm -hmm, we have here th three uh, narratives, we can say. We have the text in Spanish here, the text in Nahuatl, as the text in Spanish is a paraphrasis, not, 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 is not a direct translation. It left space to put the illustrations in the same side, uh, 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 left side. And, and this is the structure that it has the, the book uh, today. This is the, the Biblioteca Medici Lorenziana, where the book is kept. And uh, I want to, the, 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 the main goal of this presentation is to give an interpretation of the evolution and process of creation of the Historia General, uh, or Codice Florentino, and also make an analysis about the many, uh, I call it the itinerant, uh, itinerant uh, journey of the, of the book into many different editions in later times. So I am interested to follow what happened to the Florentine Codex in the last uh, 200 years. So we can see here that there are identified certain collaborators of Sagun that I would consider them really co-authors. Of, of the book. Uh, the, the five uh, 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 academics uh, from Tlatelolco, who were trilingual uh, indigenous scholars, who, uh, that were also mentioned in, in Baltasar paper, from, from this, from, oh, from this uh, start comes the manuscritos de Tepepulco and Tlatelolco here. And then we have the, uh, uh, the the, 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 well, we have here a, a, a breakdown of those, the pr primeros memoriales with the dates in which they were created, the manuscrito Tlatelolco, and then f a, a re, 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 uh, reorganization that Sagun did of the manuscript that went from four chapters into nine books and later into 12 books. Uh, there is a, a, a final version in Nahuatl there that is uh, the 1569 manuscript that is, is, is lost. And then he started the translation into Spanish. The work was suspended for uh, five years. That's why I see that this is an adventurous history and it's a miracle that we have this book today by the many vicissitudes that it happened. Uh, we have the final, the completion of the Florentine Codex, the Historia, in about 1577. Uh, then the, the manuscript uh, was lost for almost 300 years until uh, it was uh, recovered and, and restudied by Edward Seller and Francisco del Paso y Troncoso 
in the late part of the 19th century. Uh, so, but it appeared almost contemporary with the Florentine Codex, appeared a manuscript known as the Manuscript of Tolosa. There's also a very interesting story about this manuscript that I will come later. Uh, so the, we are here, the manuscript of uh, the, the Codex, Florentine Codex was sent to Spain in 1578 and arrived approximately in September of 78. Uh, uh, and Felipe, Philip II apparently gave it to the Duke of uh, to, uh, Tuscany, uh, Francisco I Medici, uh, the book between 1579 and 1587, because there was a census of the library of the Medicis uh, and uh, made by the successor of Francisco in 1587. So we know that in that period, in that frame, the book came to Italy. And it appeared in 1793 in a, in a, in a catalog. And then uh, Francisco del Paso y Troncoso made a transcription for the codex that unfortunately some of the volumes are lost. But it was the first translation that was going to be a facsimile, a facsimile fac, almost facsimilar copy from, from this. Uh, then Dibble and Anderson made the translation from Nahuatl to English in, in, tw in, in 20 years work. That was amazing. And then in 1979, we got the first facsimilar edition that was published by Alejandra Moreno Toscano and the Archivo General de la Nación uh, and published by the Mexican government. Then in 1982, Alfredo Lopez Austin and, and Josefina Garcia Quintana did the first edition of the Spanish text of the Florentine Codex. Okay? And the second and only one, there are only two facsimilar editions, was made by Editorial Giunti of Florence in 1995. But to tell you the truth, what happened is that these guys were the ones who published in 1979. So they probably just reuse the, the, uh, this, this uh, edition and reprint it again. But in reality, the, the, this is the very first one and was paid by the Mexican government, but these guys got it the same because it's exactly identical. No, there is a, a, no, not any minor difference. They, they, they didn't put any commentary, just the facsimile. Okay, continuing here. The manuscript of Tolosa is a copy of the text in Spanish of the Florentine Codex with some uh, variations. Uh, the, the correction of style and suppression of certain elements makes the difference between the, the Tolosa manuscript and the original codex. We can say that the manuscripto de Tolosa is a little bit more polished than the, the, the text of the Florentine Codex because it's an amended uh, copy. We don't know exactly who did it, but there are some suspicions that Fray Rodrigo de Sequera in Mexico did it in between the manuscript was going to Spain. Uh, there are several possibilities and several theories, but that, that's the one I, I found more interesting. Uh, in the, the, the manuscript of Tolosa appeared in a monastery, Franciscan monastery in Tolosa, in the Basque country, uh, and it was mentioned in an inventory in 1733. In 1783, Juan Bautista Muñoz, who was the cosmographer of the, the King of Spain, took the manuscript to Madrid and promised that he would give a copy to the Franciscans of Tolosa. And the copy apparently was given to the Franciscans between 1802 and 1804. But the Tolosa convent was destroyed by a fire during the French invasion. So we don't know if the, the, that copy disappeared or is a copy that appeared in the hands of a guy called Antonio Gina, because Antonio Gina was the person that was going to give, Muñoz gave to him the manuscript so he could bring it to the monastery. So we don't know, probably Ugina kept the manuscript or never gave it to the Franciscans. We cannot know that because everything burned in 1808. So we have that doubt there. And from the, uh, the interesting thing is that as the Florentine Codex was Law, hidden, nobody uh, pay attention to that for, for centuries. So all the first uh, 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 productions or the first editions of the 
eh, eh, historia general de Sagún, eh, came through this eh, copy of the manuscript of Tolosa. So there are several copies, one made by Captain Diego Garcia Panes in 1793. This is the copy that served as the base for all the next editions published until today in Spanish. Uh, Bustamante, who made the first edition in Spanish in this year, uh, uh, got his, uh, he, he basically copied the Garcia Panes uh, version. That is, has errors if you compare it with the original manuscript of Tolosa. So there was a, a, a kind of degradation in the way it was published. Then the French uh, translation came out from Bustamante. Ireneo Paz, the grandfather of Octavio Paz, produced another edition based in Bustamante. Bandelier, uh, Fanny Bandelier in 1932 tried to make a translation to English, but she only could complete four books. Uh, and Ramirez Cabañas did a very well uh, polished uh, edition in 1938. Then came Acosta Sainz, who did a comparison with the Florentine Codex for more precision, and Garibay in 1956, who made also another uh, polished, uh, or for the time, another Polish uh, edition. So this is the, the kind of uh, history that the, the the versions that we know today and that we read for many years uh, of this manuscript. This is the, man, the original manuscript of Tolosa uh, that, was, that is originally in the Colección Muñoz in the Real, Acad Real Academia de la Historia. I have a copy here that I've taken directly, directly from there. If, if anyone is interested to see it later, I have it here with me. Uh, and this is, is the, the first pages, where you can see this is a 16th century writing, not Sagun writing, so it's a copy by other person, but is the same book. Um, this is the first edition made of the Historia General de la Nueva España, made by Bustamante in 1829. There appears the book 12 already, uh, made in the one that Sagun did in 1555, okay, appears in this edition. Now, to, to finalize my talk, and with a very important part, because we, a big portion of this conference is about the book 12, that is the book of the conquest. Uh, there were two books that Sagun wrote. The 1551 that became the book 12 of the Florentine Codex was integrated about 20 years later into the Florentine Codex uh, in, in, the, in its final version. Uh, and this is the itinerary that this happened to this work. Uh, originally, um, no, no, not, not yet, not yet. <laughs> this is probably the, mo the most important part of this talk. That is, that is a still, that is a still a work in progress because I am finding more information and more information, so eventually this thing can even change in the future. But uh, this is what is up to today. Okay. He called his book, the book 12, Relación de la Conquista de Esta Nueva España, como la contaron los soldados indios que se hallaron presentes. Account of the conquest of New Spain as it was told by the Indian soldiers that were present. It was written in Tlatelolco in Nahuatl between 1550 and 1555, and that's the book that was integrated as book 12 of the Historia General in about 1568, in one of the last reorganizations. Uh, then he, uh, this, uh, the, this uh, version was utilized by people like Diego Muñoz Camargo in, in su Historia de Tlaxcala uh, in 1580, or Antonio de Herrera y Tordesillas in his Decadas. So they, it's clear that they use, as a source, this book 12, okay, this version. But Sagún, just five years before he died, he made another edition of his book that is not exactly a copy of that book, but is a, a kind of interpretation of his first book. The narrative is very similar, but there are some changes because he added a few more sources. And he, as he said, he made some additions and subtractions of material 
in relationship to the original version. So we can call it an amended version. Uh, because time, I am not going to tell in detail what are the, uh, the main differences and why Sagun decided to do this other version. But I would say, he said, se pusieron en él algunas cosas que fueron mal puestas y otras se callaron que fueron mal calladas. There were put in the first edition certain things that were incorrect and there were removed certain things also incorrectly, okay? So there were things that they added that were defective and things that they removed that was an error to remove them, according to Sagun's view. Okay, now what happened after that? So he writes the edition here and then Juan Francisco de Montemayor, who was the Presidente de la Real Audiencia of Mexico City, took the original, he, he found this book and, and got it and brought it to Spain in 1679, because he was in Mexico as president of the Audiencia. Uh, it was according to the description that Sagún gives himself in, in, the, in, the, in this uh, original in quotes, uh, it was a bilingual book made in three columns, one in rough, rough Nahuatl, the other in a more Polish, more elegant Nahuatl, and in Spanish. And it was located in the Real Academia de Historia in Madrid, but it was lost in 1808. You can see 1808 is a fatal year for Spain because so many things happened that were uh, chaotic there. Well, there, from this, we know that from this, original, we think this was this, 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 the Sagun's book, the original Sagun's book. They were made two copies, one by Fray Esteban Manchola, Fray Esteban Manchola, that was made in 1668, okay? Uh, and uh, this book passed into Agustin de Betancourt, who is that famous Franciscan friar who did the Menologio about the Franciscans. So in 1697, these guys had a copy from this uh, original, but the original was lost and is continues to be lost. But these copies were lost also, okay? So you say, how we can have the book today? Well, look what happened. Uh, then in 1828, the Count Jose Gomez de la Cortina bought in Spain a copy written in Spanish that is also lost. We, we don't know if the copy he bought was the one made, made by Manchola, that was used by Bernancourt, or was another copy that was circulating there. That's difficult to say. Well, he takes the copy to Mexico in 1832, and Carlos Maria de Bustamante, the guy who had made the first Mexican edition of the, of the Florentine Codex, uh, made a copy in 1883, a copy that is also lost, but he published the copy as a book uh, uh, with his annotations in 1840 with a very strange and peculiar name. It was called, I will say it directly uh, as, as better as I can in, in to translate this in, in English. The apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe of Mexico uh, proven, with, uh, uh, proven with refutation of the argument, the negative argument presented by Juan Bautista Muñoz who was based in the testimony of Fray Bernardino de Sagún. In other words, this is the historia original of this writing that alters the one published in 1829 in the wrong concept that that was the only one an original of said author. author. <laughs> so, uh, the, the, the American historian William Prescott made a copy uh, that's the copy I have here with me also to show it to you. Uh, he made a copy in 1839, just about the time that Bustamante was publishing his book. The, 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 the Prescott copy was copied from the Bustamante one, and this one survives. This is in the Boston Public Library now. So basically, we only have two copies of that mysterious book of 1585, that is the book published with this strange name, but uh, 
because he could have called it Relación de la Conquista de Nueva España, and that's it. No, but he put this name because he was trying to argue uh, the counter arguments of Muñoz, who was denying the apparitions of Guadalupe, so he wanted to use these two. So he complicated the things. But we have these two copies are the same because <laughs> this guy copied from here. And we hope this was well copied from the previous things. But this is what we have. So with this said, and the research that we continue doing, this is the status of the book 12 that we really have two versions. What version is better or worst? I would say both are very interesting because, for example, in the second one, in the one of 1585, is the place where they say that the Spaniards directly killed Moctezuma. Because in the, in the 1829 version, the, 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 the book 12 of the original uh, Florentine Codex, that data is not there. And that's just an example of certain changes. But there are, they were very tough because it was the direct version of the indigenous people in the first uh, book 12. They were very tough about the image of Cortes. And the image of Cortes was softened in the, in the, in the 1585 copy. So then you have, a, it's a trade-off. I think we need to, to know the two in order to really get a better picture of what, was, what changed in 30 years from what Sagún wrote in 1555 and in 1585. OK? With this said, thank you very much. I feel very short. Um, I, I want to tell, tell you all that we have a bio break for the next 15 minutes, but I also just want to say that why are we focusing so much attention on the Florentine Codex and the Book 12? It is because this is the single, let me just frame it in a very big, 40,000 feet above the ground. This is these, these, these volumes that were compiled under the direction of Father Sahagun are the most important indigenous record that we have of the Americas uh, in, in this, these years, these um, hybridic years in which there was indigenous agency following the invasion of the Spanish. So these volumes and their complex genealogies, Manuel, I hope there's not go that's not going to be on the quiz because it's really going to be a toughie to follow through which manuscripts survive. But maybe, you know, I feel like I should take a, a, a picture of it so that I can study from it. But these volumes are so precious and so critical to being able to understand the world that the Spanish found and that the indigenous had made.